name's Lori Kruger, and I'm going to be hosting today. We're going to get started. It's about 3 o'clock Central Time. Today's webinar is titled, Where to Start, Operational Journeys and Experiments. With us today presenting is Brad Power. Brad Power is a blogger for the Harvard Business Review and a partner at FCB Partners. And his firm offers research, education, and advisory services. He will share his experiences in helping organizations overcome process attention deficit disorder, which is episodic attention to operational improvement by defining shared journeys and running experiments to learn and improve performance, balancing days, today's results and building capabilities. So uh, if you have questions throughout the webinar, you can type them in the chat, and Brad will respond as he can. But there will also be time for question and answer period at the end. So welcome, everyone. And Brad, take it away. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having a conversation with you today as much as is possible through the electronic medium. <laughs> Um, so if you're looking at the, uh, the cover slide for all of this, you might notice that it talks about a few, a few key words that I want to pull out, uh, and some of them might be strange. This is about journeyed operational transformation. And uh, my friend, Brett Champlin, who invited me to speak today, and I see he's on, he said that all of you are very sophisticated process improvement professionals, that uh, you do big P process and not small P process. What I'm going to be focusing on is two aspects of process improvement. Uh, what I've got the picture there, the innovation engine and anti-fragile. So these are some ideas that I've developed around when your process improvement gets into big change, radical change, what we used to call business reengineering. And then in the zone of anti-fragile, which is a notion from Nicholas Nassim Taleb that I wrote about, which is that most organizations um, try to optimize their success model, and they get lean, and they take out waste, and they get uh, you know, better and better at delivering on their current operating model, but then they can get blindsided. And so they're, they're rigid, they're fragile, they're not anti-fragile. And so that we as process improvement professionals can be looking at ways that we can build problem solving as a discipline into our organizations to make us not fragile, but anti-fragile. I hope that those two ideas, the innovation aspect and the anti-fragile aspect, will be clear after I get through the presentation. The, the takeoff point for this is a question that I was given by um, a uh, Six Sigma belt at, a, at a, a retailing company. And sh she said, where do you start when you have an idea to improve operational performance? And I'm going to come back to these the answer to these questions at the end, but possibilities might be launching a program, uh, soliciting local improvements, or maybe focusing those um, uh, in uh, focusing those improvements in uh, one particular area, or you can run everyone through training and Lean and Six Sigma, or you can set up an organization for, for process in the center, or you can embed it in the existing organization, or sometimes you can invest in new systems. And um, without jumping ahead, when I come to the end, I'll come back to these questions based on three stories that I want to lead off with and um, uh, then illustrate some of the aspects of, of innovation and being anti-fragile. So that's the overview for the discussion. So the first uh, story, I always like to start with stories. This is uh, a story of a primary care physician practice that I'm working with. And they're moving in their transformation from, that, for those of you who don't know on the left, that's Marcus Welby, MD. And there was a television show years ago, and he was a family doctor. And he knew everybody in his community. And he was uh, a solo operator, and he provided uh, specialized solutions for each of his patients uh, based on sick care. And he was paid for his services. So that's the traditional model of primary care. It's based on sickness, and someone comes in, and they get paid for that service. And if you're following the healthcare situation in the US and in other places, 
that is an increasingly um, inappropriate model for care delivery. And it's moving to much more about being patient-centered um, and based on teams, hence the picture of a team working with a patient. And the world is moving much more to a, being paid for outcomes. And uh, of course, with Obamacare in the news today, uh, hopefully everybody is aware of some of these, these big changes. And the healthcare system in general is taking approaching 20% of GDP in the US, and it's unsustainable. And so the, the, almost everyone in healthcare is looking at declining reimbursements for the care they're providing, and they're all looking for ways to reduce costs. And so the physician practice I'm working with um, is making progress through experiments. And so they've taken some of their major pain points, which are the ones here on the left. The um, weekend urgent care was one, where they um, so basically, the weekends are run uh, completely different from during the week, and there's limited capacity. So if you're a patient and you'd like to come in on a weekend, you, you have great difficulty in getting in. And uh, so they've, they've run some experiments to improve their operational performance on the weekends. Another problem was um, when, on, on, when new patients are onboarded, they don't know whether that patient needs to be seen by a doctor immediately or whether they can just be, wait until the first thing that happens to them. Um, another problem they had was with too many messages uh, coming into their um, inboxes. So the doctors are, are um, handling patients all day, and uh, they've got all these messages, some of which are noise and some of which require immediate response. And so they needed to clarify this, this new medium. So these are the kind of problems, and what they've done is they've set up a series of experiments um, with the clinical people, the uh, chiefs, uh, driving the process, and they're looking at addressing these pain points and um, at the same time learning from those, uh, addressing those, change, cha uh, those problems and building capability in the organization generally. So that's one approach. That's the kind of, you might say, the bottom-up, let's have uh, a, a lot of people suggest ways to improve work. A second example, a second story, uh, another client that I worked with was a large uh, oil company. And they moved from 132 countries and each one managing as its own business to uh, managing their uh, downstream business globally. And they defined an enterprise process model and they simplified and standardized uh, across the practices they had across all 132 countries so that they could, um, on a more consistent basis, handle their global customers on a consistent, reliable, and low-cost basis. And to do that, they largely did it on the back of a single instance implementation of an enterprise uh, software product from SAP. So they had global SAP, and associated with that was a set of global standard processes. Um, so that's a second, that's a kind of, you might say, a, um, a big bang kind of process transformation. And it was driven by a system. That's a, so that's a second model of how some organizations have made change. And a third model here is with um, an, insurance, an insurance company, which has really focused uh, recognizing that the world has changed and they, um, all the routine work has been automated, and so they really rely on their knowledge workers to, whether it's process claims or um, handle customer inquiries. And so they've really looked at enabling and supporting their um, customer-facing associates um, and helping enable them and empower them to uh, deal with customers. And to do that, um, They've uh, provided some um, tools for conversation. They, they had a um, classic Six Sigma belt program uh, developing uh, process improvement capabilities in a lot of people and, and the whole hierarchy of belts. And then their IT people have developed a lot of tools that enable their um, frontline customer contact people to um, uh, better serve customers and, get, and give them the tools to answer questions themselves. 
Uh, one of those tools is a, um, one of these internal collaboration social uh, tools. And the other is they've got a search-based, um, it's sort of like a Google search for a repository, a repository of best practices. So that's a third model. So there, these, these three models um, are all suitable for each of, of their um, situations. But I wanted to think about um, some ways of looking at how would you know which is the right approach for your organization. And, a, and an important first distinction uh, I'd like to suggest is, is between what I'm calling the performance engine or innovation. The performance engine is improvements to the basic success model of your organization. It's day-to-day -day changes you make that are sustaining and incremental. Uh, this, this model of the performance engine assumes that the business is pretty much repeatable and predictable, that uh, we know how to make investments to improve the way we do our operations, and we can predict how those changes will occur which is distinct from the innovation, engines where, innovation engine where you're making changes that are occasional and they're big changes and you actually don't know what the outcome is going to be. So it's unpredictable. And it, for the innovation engine, the discipline that you need is the scientific method. You need to have disciplines around running experiments, around having a hypothesis about what the experiment result will be. And that's why the picture there of the uh, young scientists looking at the, the uh, beaker of red uh, chemical is, what did we get here? Was I expecting red or was I expecting blue? Um, so that's, that's the world of the innovation engine. And it's different where you can predict. You run the performance engine pretty much within the management hierarchy. For the innovation engine, you really need separated projects that, uh, that look at any change you would make as a, learning, uh, as a learning opportunity. So some of the actions that I've seen for if you're in the innovation space, and just to make this distinction, again, if you're in the performance engine space, you're going to be working with your traditional command and control management structures. Silos are fine. It's OK to just operate as you would within your normal management hierarchy and systems. In the innovation space, you need to be thinking about um, Disruptions that may, opportunities and threats in the marketplace. Uh, so you want to be out there looking and sensing and responding to the, to the market. One of the things that I've seen, I'm, I'm writing a blog post about, is um, creating a sensing station in Silicon Valley or equivalent. There are over 200 companies that have established um, outposts in Silicon Valley to, to be in touch with the high-tech developments there. And they're either doing venture investing or they're just a listening outpost, or sometimes they're forming partnerships and collaborations and doing R&D. So if you're an innovator, you want to be out uh, sensing what's going on in the market so you aren't blindsided by uh, what might be coming at you. Um, as I mentioned before, you need a disciplined experimental learning process and methodology. Um, you need hypotheses. You need clear expectations about the outcomes. Um, you probably want to have labs, which are controlled environments where you test ideas, pilots where you um, take them to real customers in a small controlled environment, and then rollout where you uh, take those process changes out broadly. You need a, a, a methodology for all of those stages. Uh, another notion that I, I think is really important is to shift the, your thinking about benefits for innovations from ROI to venture capital. So the, the financial people in an organization will try to apply to um, process changes, innovative process changes, or other business changes. They'll try to apply cost-benefit analysis that assumes that we know, again, the kind of incremental change that we'll get from a well-understood problem. But if we don't know what the outcome is going to be, what the venture capitalists have is limited risk. They have a notion that if I invest let's say $100,000 in a startup. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, I've lost that $100,000. This is the kind of thinking that innovators need. They need to be able to say, we're going to invest a certain amount, and we're going to run an experiment, and we don't know what we'll get, 
but if we if it works out well, then we'll invest another hundred thousand. The worst case is we'll lose the hundred thousand. It's a completely different financial mindset. And then there's a lot of the last point is for innovate in, in the innovation area. There's a lot of thought that needs to be given to how the innovation interfaces with the performance engine. So there are going to be some aspects of the performance engine that is going to provide resources and assets and capabilities to the innovation. But you need to be very clear about what those are and the areas where you're completely innovating and doing something totally new. So I was working with an insurance company, and they were standing up one of these uh, uh, payments with practices that would be done on an outcome basis. So if you had a hip or knee replacement, there would be one payment for all the people involved in that hip or knee replacement, all the uh, providers. Uh, there could be eight or ten different providers involved in a hip or knee replacement. So there were some aspects of that new business that they needed to completely create a whole new, hire people from the outside, a whole new set of skills. Some of the capabilities could come from the insurance company. They need to be very clear about which was which and how they would interface between the two. So that's uh, some comments about big P process reengineering, big change and innovation, and when you're in that space, some of the disciplines you need to, to manage it well. The other, the other area that I wanted to talk in terms of broader than just sort of run-of-the-mill process improvement is the notion of making your organization anti-fragile. And for the, the lean thinkers among you, I think this will be very well understood that um, you can always get short-term results by just, if you're a senior person, you have the answer, just getting the answer and doing it. Um, but, in a, uh, but you're not building the organization's capability. So there are things you can do, hence the picture on the right of people doing problem solving. There are ways you can go about your process improvement that improve the capability of the organization in general to problem solve. Um, one of the things that um, some of my friends who, who um, know a lot about Toyota, after Toyota had a series of problems with the, with the nuclear meltdown, with the supply chain disruptions they had and so on, with the problems they had with slipping brakes, they said, Toyota will be back, no problem. And why were they so confident? Because they know that Toyota has a built-in capability to solve problems. So whatever comes at them, they have an organizational capability to be anti-fragile, that they will sense and respond and they'll move forward. Fragile, just to uh, complete some of the words on this, fragile organizations are tuned around a model where they make and sell products. So they are focused on producing lots of widgets. It's kind of Henry Ford's any color so long as it's black. They're a good deal. You push them off the line, and it's someone else's job to sell them. The management structure for fragile organizations that are rigid are command and control. So there are hier the hierarchy is the model, and you tell people what to do. And you have planning at the center. So that, and the notion is because everything is predictable, that you can have central planning and predict that next year will look like this year, and therefore uh, we can predict what the future will be, and we can have central planning. In the anti-fragile mo model of the business and of the organization, make and sell is re replaced by sense and respond. So we're sensing and responding. We're listening to the market, and we're responding to opportunities and threats in the market. Uh, it's more outside-in focused rather than inside-out. Uh, command and control models are replaced by problem solving. And for problem solving to work, instead of central planning, what you need is context and coordination. By that, I mean you need mission, vision, values, uh, principles, governing principles, and rules about how uh, different parts of the organization work together so that you can empower people at the front line. And that's, that's going to create a, an organization which will adapt and be agile and move as opposed to one that's uh, fragile. And this, this um, next slide called Actions for Anti-Fragilistas, uh, you'll see the credit for the Lean Enterprise Institute at the bottom. And this is one I developed for that, that first healthcare organization. So at the top of the pyramid, you have the um, outcomes that you want, which is the classic triple aim in healthcare. Uh, which is patient experience, quality, and lower cost. Um, 
So those are the outcomes you want. Then the two pillars are the balancing of both delivering results and building capability. And those things are always balanced. So you're looking for ways. Again, at Toyota, they say our job is to build people, not to get results. So you're balancing building capability, long-term capability in the organization through the experiments that you run. And in the center, you have some of the infrastructure, the management systems that are required to make this happen. So leadership, governance, compensation measures. For example, the healthcare organization I'm working with, all the doctors are on independent uh, contracts where the more transactions they perform, the more money they get. It's the fee-for-service model. And so that often creates behaviors that are inconsistent. So if you don't change that fundamental compensation model and the measures, you're not going to change their behavior. And then um, the foundation there are behaviors and techniques. These are the, the tools of how we're going to go about changing the way we do our work. Um, respect for people being a, a classic one, again, from, from a Toyota, and then the techniques being some of the methods that people would be trained in so that we can continue to solve problems and, and move the organization forward. Um, again, Brett Champlin encouraged me to, to uh, he said that many of the, the process improvement experts like you would be interested in, in these implications for change management. Um, so of course, people and cultural change is essential to making particularly innovative changes. Again, you don't need to so much in the performance engine because you just have the t traditional management hierarchy to solve uh, people change. But particularly if you're in the zone of, of innovation or being anti-fragile, you need a different kind of manager and a different kind of environment. Uh, the, the context I already uh, referenced or mentioned before, uh, you need to define the journey that you're on. There's a picture here. The picture here is meant to be. It's got two things going on that I liked about it. It's got the North Star, uh, which is the guiding um, goal that is often, again, referenced in Lean. And then you've got the servant leader helping the, um, the, the, the friend uh, in the direction of getting to the North Star. So part of it, what you require is a context, um, a clear sense of urgency that we need to, to go somewhere, and a vision of where we're going, and these governing principles. A second key principle is respect for people. In this fast-changing world, particularly in an anti-fragile uh, uh, goal, you want to have um, the people who are being, the, ch the, the work that is being changed should be defined by the people that are impacted, not having subject matter experts. And we may, you know, we can talk about that some more, but the, the, um, there needs to be humility in the leadership and in the uh, people suggesting process changes and to the extent possible engaging the people that are impacted. And then another principle is servant leadership. We need coaches, not command and control. And the goal of the leader should be to develop people versus getting short-term results. That may sound like classic stuff to you. OK, so finally, and this is where the most fun, and maybe we can have some discussion. Um, and maybe uh, Lori can, uh, this is, uh, this is, I'll particularly request questions and comments on this last slide or, or throughout. But, this is, this, is, this is all debatable and I expect <laughs> provocative and controversial. Um, but I've gone back to the original uh, slide that I had, which is the same question, where do you start? And given the um, ideas and the distinctions that I provided, um, the interventions that you could make to improve uh, processes uh, are contingent on whether you're trying to optimize for the performance engine or whether you're doing innovation or whether you're trying to make your organization anti-fragile. And so what I've got here is the pluses mean it has a positive impact, and the, and the minuses mean it has a negative impact. And when I've got plus and minus, it's because it's got some pluses and some minuses. <laughs> so let me go through a few of these. So launching a program soliciting many local improvements is similar to the, the first story that I told of the healthcare uh, primary care practice. And it's going to have a positive impact on the performance engine because uh, they're dealing with pain points. So it's, it's going to have uh, good results in terms of improving day-to-day -day work. 
The negative is that, it, that this process is not going to generate breakthrough um, improvements in the performance engine. It will also have a mild but positive impact on the innovation engine. And of course, it's going to have a big impact on anti-fragile, because all of the ideas are coming from the people. In this case, in my example, it was the clinicians are improving the way the care is delivered. So they're going to be totally engaged in problem solving and, and own the results. You'll get sustained results. And you're also building the capability of the organization to solve future problems. If you focus resources in one area for more dramatic benefits, uh, this might be taking a dispersed, which I did with uh, one um, healthcare insurance company, where we took a lot of belt activity that was broadly dispersed throughout the organization and focused it in one particular area, which was their relationships with providers. You're going to have an impact on the performance engine, but you're going to be taking those resources away from broader impacts. It's definitely going to impact, it's going to be an innovation approach. And whether it's anti-fragile or not, uh, it's, it's not clear. It depends on, on how you implement it. The third line, running everyone through training and how to improve work like a Six Sigma or a Lean, and that was the, um, the third example that I had. In terms of performance engine, it's going to be positive because uh, particularly if those people are embedded in the units, which is an, a typical design, they're going to be making improvements in the current model, which will show up for uh, a better humming and tuned performance engine. The negative is that if those executives who run those areas are looking at short-term results, they might prefer to work harder, not smarter. So they might view the resources that are being devoted to improving the way they work, working smarter, as taking away from just short-term results. So if you have a very short-term focus and you don't really want to get to root cause, you might view this as a negative. Um, the innovation engine is going to benefit from training people on Six Sigma and Lean because they're going to start thinking about how about customers and how work can be improved. The reason I put a question mark under anti-fragile is because while in theory running everyone through training to improve work is going to increase your capability organization. In practice, in a lot of organizations, um, it's actually made organizations more fragile. You can point to a lot of organizations. Someone, when I ran this by them, pointed to, for example, Kodak as an organization that had an active Six Sigma program, but it did nothing for their anti-fragility. Um, so it depends. In theory, they should be making the organization, but in practice, the way that a lot of organizations implement Six Sigma and Lean, it's not actually making them more anti-fragile. The next one, set up an organization for process. Um, again, as before, with the, with the performance engine, that could be good if it, if it improves the performance of the, of the basic operations. And it's a negative if it diverts resources from just running day to day. The innovation engine will benefit from an organization for process because there's attention, particularly if they're focused on end-to-end -end and customers. And then anti-fragile, because again, there are resources being devoted to um, change and improvement, that will help the anti-fragility of an organization. Embedding it in the existing organization is going to be good news for the performance engine because they just want to tune up what they've got. It's going to be a negative for the innovation engine because Everybody's going to be focused on optimizing today and not about doing dramatic changes or outside. And it's going to be uh, both a plus and a minus for anti-fragile, depending on how it's implemented. And investing in new systems, which is the second story um, example, um, the performance engine will look at that at the plus or a minus. The reason I say that is because you'll get a discontinuous breakthrough, perhaps, in performance, but then the big fear of everyone is that you will then uh, have concrete and rigidity form around the, the new ERP system that you put in. So that's, that's, that can be a mixed bag. It's a big step forward, potentially, and then um, you might solidify around that, and then it gets very hard to change. The innovation engine um, will look at a new system as probably that discontinuous change. And then the anti-fragile, again, will, will look at as a mixed bag Many new systems, as in the second example, get imposed on people. They don't really have an opportunity to influence the design. And so for them, it looks like 
they have to comply with something that gets imposed from above. It doesn't feel like they're, anybody's capability is building, being built. It just feels like they have to go along with the big system change. So um, uh, I, I, I think I will, at this point, uh, lean on Lori to uh, go through the questions that you've all been submitting. And please continue to submit questions. And I will, um, I will maybe Lori and I can have a dialogue with Lori sort of moderating the questions that have been submitted. OK, well, the first one is from um, Mike. And he asks you to give a specific example of how training does not support anti-fragility. I think training would generally support anti-fragility. It's building capability, and that's what anti-fragile is about. Um, so it's, that would almost always be the case, and that would be the first row there. Um, you know, soliciting many local improvements and doing training. The, the number three, where I put a question mark, it wasn't really so much about the training as in anti-fragility, I guess, is two parts. One is, is it's problem solving and building capabilities. But the second part is sensing and responding. And so if the, you know, just lean as heard by many senior executives and Six Sigma, which has often had a very much of a financial orientation, um, they both are about taking out waste. They are about streamlining and tuning the performance engine. They may not be necessarily, uh, you know, if, if they're done right, they're looking at customers. They've got voice of the customer. But if, if, if they're very focused internally on taking out waste, you may get blindsided, as Kodak was, by a third party. So it's not the training that I would say that's um, not going to help with anti-fragility. The training will always help with anti-fragility because you're building capability, and you're building adaptiveness, you're building agility. But there's another aspect that's required that, requ that means that you shouldn't be so internally focused on improving your operations that you lose the um, devoting some resources to keeping in touch with what's going on out in the world, sensing and responding, like I mentioned uh, putting an office in uh, Silicon Valley or equivalent. OK. Um, and then I think this is a follow-up. I'm going to try to not really go in order to try to follow up on Mike's question again. Wouldn't a new system be in response to solving a performance issue or adding new innovative functions? Yes. Yes, it would, have, uh, it would of course. I mean, sometimes the, the story that I told <coughs> it, it was a <coughs> with the oil company was, it was a pretty interesting one in that the justification for their putting in a new system was because they had 132 countries with 132 systems. And if they went to a single instance of their software, they could save so much money that it justified their investment in going onto a common platform just in terms of the uh, software licensing fees. And initially, that's how they justified it. So it didn't have, initially, although they, they came on later <laughs> because they said this, you know, just viewing it as a systems project was not really, uh, a systems replacement project was really not worthy of the kind of investment they were making. But um, at least in that instance, the system was, was about putting them on a new platform, not about better capability and not about um, you know, better process performance. So generally, it will be and should be, but not always. OK. Um, next question from Brett is kind of um, just a definition thing. Anti-fragile equals the same as adaptable, kind of nimble and agile. Is that your reference there? Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I think that that's generally true. Let me, let me uh, describe a little bit more of the definition from um, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, he says that most systems are fragile, that they break under stress. Other systems, if you stress them, are resilient. They, they bounce back quickly. And so you hear about resilience. The reason that he coined the odd term anti-fragile was that some systems get stronger through stress. So you can imagine biological systems that if they are, are stressed, they um, adapt, and they get stronger. Um, and so the notion that um, an organization, again, I'll just, I'll just say Toyota, um, 
has a bunch of things thrown at it. A uh, nuclear plant, a supply chain disruption, a set of, of safety issues. Uh, as they solve those issues, not only are they solving those issues, but they're actually getting stronger for the next one. So they're building capabilities. So the notion of anti-fragile um, is a little, I guess, a little bit stronger, but it's, but it's very closely related to adapting or being nimble. Okay. Uh, next question from Bobby. What is a big difference from innovation engine and scrum teams trying to solve a problem? For example, anti-fragile teams. Yeah, I think those are those would both um, th like a scrum team would probably be um, blending or merging or actually addressing both innovate the innovation engine and, and the anti fragile dimension. Um, the innovation engine because they're a methodology for trying a lot of small changes fast, and so in, in that notion of experimentation, um, we're going to um, be trying things. That we don't know the outcome, but we're trying a lot of small experiments, so we're adapting. And that's going to be anti-fragile, both because we're adapting, we're evolving, and also because that kind of scrum method, is, I think, has a, um, a broader engagement of more empowered people in, in cross-functional teams and so on. So it's going to have both the kind of the human dimension of it as well as the adaptation dimension. Okay. All right. And next from Alexander. Does operational improvement performance begin by senior management? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great and typical question. Um, there, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, there's, a, there's a guy named Art Byrne. I don't know if, if, if all of you are acquainted with him, but he was the star of the turnaround at Wiremold that was written up in Lean Thinking. And he's recently come out with a book called The Lean Turnaround. And at a recent uh, conference that I was at, he was asked, um, you know, what should you do? Because he's very directive. He says, basically, the leader should be like this. The leader should be like running, running Kaizen events, and they should be doing, getting out and doing gamble walks. And the leader should do this, and the leader should do that. And if, you know, if you, it has to be led from the top, and the leaders have to behave this way. And then somebody asked from the audience, and they said, well, what if I don't have leadership like this? And he said, he said, basically, you can leave. <laughs> you can go to another company where you can find leaders like that. But then I think he, he, had, he thought about it afterwards, because that's a pretty black and white option. And then the argument was, well, do things in your area of responsibility that demonstrate the uh, continuous improvement sorts of, of benefits. And then hopefully you can grow from there. So everybody has an opportunity to do something within the scope of where they have responsibility. And so um, it's a bit of a cop-out. There's, there's a tendency for a lot of, of uh, practitioners to uh, look at le leadership and say, I wish I had leaders that were like this. Um, but in, in reality, in my experience, 90% of leaders aren't like the kind of leaders you would want. And so it, it's kind of like uh, if you live in the Pacific Northwest and if you didn't ever go outside whenever it rained, you'd never go outside. <laughs> so you know, if you're... If you're um, going to be in an organization and you have leaders that aren't perfect, <clears throat> I think you still need to try and do what you can. And so that do what you can means do as much uh, as you can within the uh, areas that you can impact and hope, hope that it um, becomes a, a groundswell and that other people pick up whatever you're able to do. Okay. And now from Pat, under the innovation engine, I would see set up an organization for process and embed as both positive and a sequence. OK. So I think Pat's talking to that particular cell in the matrix. So uh, setting up an organization for process and embedding it as both positive. OK. Yeah, the argument against uh, creating a separate organization, so I um, I did research, I've done research over the years. This is probably even, you know, for the last 10 years I've done research in um, organizations that have set up um, internal consulting groups or centers of excellence or some kind of groups or if you've got all the process belts in a pool. And um, I've seen many of those shut down when leadership changes, 
when uh, the, econ the economy changes, and these are viewed as discretionary resources. And so the people in the performance engine look at um, a centralized group like that. I mean, I can talk about J&J did this. Um, Staples recently did. I mean, a number of companies have, and EMC years ago. Um, so the people in the performance engine look at the centralized group as a nice to have, but not a need to have. And when the times get tough, I can just, again, work harder, not smarter. So while it is true that we as process and innovation and anti-fragile advocates would argue that setting up these organizations are both positives, I would agree. Um, from the narrow perspective of someone who's focused on short-term results and wants to run the performance engine and optimize it in the short term, all of that investment looks like uh, something that's optional. OK. Uh, moving on, next question from Alexander. How do you deal with senior management focus in getting results instead of improving operational performance? Right. Um, so what you're saying is that um, in, on the change management slide, on the previous slide, um, this is on developing people uh, as opposed to getting results, which, which came through in a couple of places. Um, that is, a, you know, how, how would you get them off of short-term results if all, all their war, war there's, a, there's one of these great quotes, I think. It's hard to get them, what's it, it goes something, I think it was Upton Sinclair or something. It's, it's, it's hard to get a man's mind off of thinking about what, uh, you know, pays, pays his, is, is in his paycheck or something. Um, so if, if managers are measured and compensated for uh, results, then they will optimize for results. Um, I find that in, in um, family-owned organizations, there's a longer time horizon, uh, or you know, not not for profit or or non non publicly traded. Obviously, there's there's a, a focus on the longer term and on developing people. Um, there are some organizations that have that. Again, Toyota as a tradition. Um, uh, it is it is. Hard. I can't. I'm trying to think about how you would shift. I think you would have to change the incentives. Um, that is, you would have to make it clear that you you are rewarded for building, pe developing people. So your performance management system would have to have whatever whatever the name is in your organization, some kind of um, objectives. Uh, so if you're managing by objectives, you would have to have objectives for senior leaders that would have developing people on a par with getting short-term results. And then you'd probably also have to have some role modeling and some training. Anytime that people have to make shifts in behavior, um, it's hard for them to get out of the way that they've traditionally done things. And so you would need some education and training and some coaching and some role modeling. So I think it, it would require all of those things to get uh, a shift in leader behavior. Okay. All right, uh, from Mike, what are your thoughts on the current and future state of ISO 9001, and in your view, does it include the operational performance context you have presented today? Hmm. Hmm. So I'm, I'm going back. So I'm, I'm not a uh, manufacturing expert, and I don't know ISO all that well. Um, I believe that it has to do with documenting your processes um, more than it has to do with improving your processes, but I, I could be wrong. And so I'm trying to think how, if we added that as a line item on this last slide, let's just sort of think about it. So if I had an ISO 9000 as a motivator for understanding the current state and, and um, documenting my processes, how would that look? So the performance engine perspective would be, it's a lot of resource to go doing that documenting. Are you sure we need to do that? Um, but if I did, it would probably uncover opportunities for improvement, and it would help me with training people who are new. So I'd probably say you know, plus and minus for performance engine. 
On the innovation engine, I would say this has nothing to do with the innovation engine. Um, that's an investment in documenting what we do today. It's not going to likely identify breakthroughs, although you can tell me, those who you know who know ISO can tell me if you would come up with breakthroughs. I suspect not. And then in terms of anti-fragile, it might have some anti-fragile effects because in documenting the processes, we would probably um, get the wisdom of and maybe some of the tacit knowledge of some of the more senior and experienced uh, workers in the processes. So we might, we might learn something if it was done in a um, constructive way that had some, uh, some adaptation benefits, not just, you know, not just a documentation exercise, but there was an opportunity to do something with it. Um, so since I may be miss, miss, you know, I, I may not know ISO 9000, so if, if, um, if, if please ask a follow-up question if I've, if I've misrepresented what it is. All right, and moving on from Brett, it seems to me that service companies are by nature more anti-fragile than manufacturing organizations. Do you agree? Hmm. Well, it's certainly the case that because service organizations are customer-oriented and because a lot of what they do is not bricks and mortar, it's not physical things, they're more agile or flexible, it's easier to change. So a service organization can probably pivot and move in a different direction uh, because it's either bits or people, it's not physical assets. Whereas if you've got a manufacturing organization, um, a lot of what you do is locked down into physical plants and assets and, and, and people. So that part, um, I guess, would argue that manufacturing is a little more fragile and rigid. Um, there are a lot of advantages, though, um, to that manufacturing has, as you probably know, in process improvement generally, because you can see the work. Uh, you know, if, if as, as Brett works at an insurance company, uh, you, it's, it's, kind of, it's harder to see the work. You know, if there used to be paper and it flowed through, you could tell if there was an inventory backlog next to uh, somebody's desk. But now it's all in some computer queue somewhere. So um, there are some advantages um, to, um, you know, the, visual, the whole notion of visual management um, can be a lot easier in a manufacturing environment. So you can see problems and you can learn, you can solve problems, you can make things better, and it's all visual and tangible. So I, I guess it would be kind of mixed. I would say, in general, the service organization you do a big program and you shrink the uh, the footprint of your operations by a third. Um, that's very visible, um, and so you can you can, and that's very then encouraging or or. Um, uh, motivating for people to make that kind of change. Okay. And from Bobby, seems to me a lot of concepts of for anti-fragilistas lend itself towards Kanban Scrum Agile. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. That um, any kind of method that engages people in problem solving. Um, is exactly what anti-fragile is, is about. That's why I, I use that sort of photo as the icon for it. Uh, if you're building capabilities around um, a bunch of people coming together and working on a problem together, then you're Not only solving the problem at hand, but you're building the you're building the ability to solve problems generally, and that's going to help you. Being being more anti-fragile, and so all of those those techniques. Um, uh, I, I, I guess Kanban. So Scrum and Agile, I'm definitely on the on the on on uh, the wavelength with Kanban. I'm less less clear about. Okay. 
All right. Um, and here's a question from someone who unfortunately signed in late, but I missed the earlier parts of the presentation. Can you advise on some resources in order to begin the process of helping improve operational performance along the lines you've discussed? And follow up to that is what certifications are relevant to begin this process? Okay. Um, so there are a couple of, 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 of well, there are two, two or three books uh, come to mind that I think are very good resources for this. Um, on the innovation question, on the innovation engine, there's a book called The Other Side of Innovation and um, called Solving the Execution Challenge. Uh, Vijay Govan Darajan and Chris Trimble. And they spent a lot of time talking about the distinction between the performance engine and the innovation engine. And then in terms of, of being anti-fragile, uh, the book that I like best is called The Adaptive Enterprise by Stephen Haeckel, H-A-E-C-K-E-L. And, and then it, it's almost the same distinction from the um, performance engine and the innovation engine. But then they look at it not as an innovation initiative, but as a management system. So they're looking at the, the whole enterprise and how you can make it and they call it the sense and respond, creating the sense and respond organization. Those, those are the two references. In terms of certification, um, these are not tools and techniques. I mean, usually certification applies to tools and techniques. Um, I work with um, FCB partners. It was in the um, opening. And, and we have a, a cer certification of process mastery. And so we offer uh, education in the broader area uh, of business reengineering, which would line up with the innovation engine, and increasingly we're getting into this world of anti-fragile. So without uh, this being a paid, paid political announcement, um, check out FCB Partners, and, and maybe we would have something there. And there is, we do have a certification of process mastery. Well, um, there's another question coming through, but right now there's nothing. Um, there's nothing imminent, and we've got about six more minutes, people, before we need to wrap up. So if there's any last questions coming through, now would be the time. So um, just, I guess, in a, as a wrap-up thing, I didn't include my um, email address or contact information. I think you could probably find me on LinkedIn, um, or I, as, as, you know, I blog for the Harvard Business Review, so you can find my blogs on the Harvard Business Review, or someone, I think, requested a copy of the slides. I'd be happy to give those uh, if you contact me. Um, uh, it's bpower at fcbpartners.com. Uh, if, if anybody would like to continue this dialogue. I'm particularly interested in, in uh, if anybody has any uh, comments on the, the last slide, because I know that was uh, potentially a little controversial. Well, I think that, I think that's it. Uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we hope that it was it was valuable for you. These slides and the webinar recording will be posted on the members only section of the ABPMP website. Please allow us a few days to get that up and running. And thank you very much, Brad, for your time. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right. All right.